in uh, chapter three, the harbor, and she yes. speaks about the harbor of hospitality. Um, remember that um, the entire book is about Acts chapter 27. Paul, the apostle, going on this journey on a ship. He's actually a prisoner headed to Rome to stand trial before Caesar. And um, he has appealed to the court of Caesar, and, and it, it, it entails him going on this long journey. Aristarchus is on that ship, too, and also Luke is on the ship. Um, I heard a pastor call me at one time. We were headed to general council, and there were a lot of Assemblies of God pastors on an airplane, and, and uh, there were some pretty important people um, on the airplane. And um, I, all of us are servants in the kingdom of God, so I don't really like this terminology because it sounds like... Uh, like business administration kind of uh, talk, but it, it says it aptly. There were some real movers and shakers on this airplane, and somebody that I knew leaned over and said to me, man, if I was the devil, I'd try to take out this airplane. <laughs> you know, like, let's, let's pray, you know. And, and, um, um, that's, you know, that's, by the way, that's very comforting when you're flying the airplane and somebody says that to you. Yeah. Um, wow. But um, anyway, uh, I, in, in one sense, boy, if, if you were the devil in that first century, wouldn't you want to take out Paul and Luke? I mean, those two are responsible for the majority of the New Testament. Paul wrote 13 letters. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. Uh, Luke wrote more in terms of volume than Paul did, but Paul wrote more in terms of what we call propositional truth, uh, teaching, practical theology, just important, important people, and um, they were both on this boat. So what she does, she talks about each, each chapter is a little bit of a leg of the journey, and uh, maybe just a different perspective. Uh, last week we talked about a motley crew. And we modeled that for you just as church was starting. Did you notice our Royal Rangers carrying the table out? <laughs> that goes our motley crew right there. And, uh, um, and this week is about the harbor, the place where it's just, it's, um, it's a place of peace. Amen. Um, don't you love the safety and the peace of the harbor? And um, I, I do. I I love to, uh, Stephanie and I, we will go sometimes to San Diego. Pastor Darren and Heather are headed to San Diego in a few weeks. He, you know, he's so thrilled to get to do that. I'm thrilled that you guys get to go. Amen. Need that it's summer. a missions trip. So just so you know, I'm taking fun. You know, fun yeah. <laughs> Mission Beach. Mission Beach. <laughs> okay, this has gone askew very, very badly. That's part of that Motley crew. That's the Motley crew. Um, you know, the thing about ships, well, what I was going to say, we love to go out on uh, Coronado Island and just go down on the, on the bay and look across the shore back at the skyline of San Diego. It's just beautiful, so yes. relaxing. And uh, down in that harbor, they have huge, huge ships. Uh, some of you have seen them. We've, we toured the Midway um, when Nick and Taylor were getting ready to go across the pond to go over to be in Aviano, Italy at the air base there. And, um, by the way, I spoke with Nick just this morning, and he's, he's meeting with chaplains, and there's a chaplain who's there uh, on the base who's um, he's there just observing for two weeks. He's in the process of becoming a chaplain. And he's, um, Nick said, it's exciting for me to just be able to talk with him because he's learned all the latest technique about being an Air Force chaplain, and that's Nick's goal. And, and um, so right now he's the worship director for Protestant services at Aviano Air Base. And then Taylor just took her test for staff sergeant. And she doesn't, won't find out until August how she did, but I'm, I'm just so proud of my son and daughter-in-law, just love them. But we went and toured the Midway. And, uh, and then another time with Zach and Nick, Steph and I went and toured uh, the Queen Mary. And boy, just massive, huge, huge ships. And you get the sense when you go on something that big, 
that um, this ship was never meant to stay in the harbor. It was designed to be out on the open water. Look how massive, how strong it is. And, and um, now they, they are wonderful museums, yes, but, but ships were never meant to be in the harbor. But isn't it nice to dock in the harbor of peace and safety sometimes? And sometimes God has allowed us as Christians, if I may, if, if I could do this, we are all his ships and we all journey across treacherous waters at times. Sometimes you're just out on the open sea and you're just sailing and, and uh, man, it's just smooth as glass. And then other times you're facing storms. But every once in a while, he allows you to just pull into the harbor and dock and rest a little bit. And, and uh, so the harbor is, is the place of restoration. Now, what Kay Barnett does in this, uh, in this chapter, Burnett, not Barnett, I'm getting my, <laughs> Kay Burnett, yeah. Um, what she does is she, she talks about the harbor and, and it is a place where hospitality is on full display. So, um, sometimes in the harbor you're the one giving the hospitality. Sometimes in the harbor, you're the one receiving the hospitality. Hospitality is such an important and beautiful ministry in the body of Christ. Yes. Yes. And uh, so she talks about one time when she was really, really sick and couldn't cook. And the kids, you know, were depending yes. on her to make the meal. But I don't know if she had the flu bug or just what it was, just knocked on her back. And she's in bed and she hears Jim in the kitchen rattling pots and pans yeah. around. And, and she just thought, I'm supposed to be in there cooking. But she just took the cover and put it over her head. And I couldn't, you know, just couldn't even. And, and then in a little while, he comes into the room with a tray. And he has, uh, he has made fresh, it's just hot potato soup. And she says it was such a, a beautiful act of generosity and just love and compassion. And it tasted so good. It was so soothing for my sore throat. And, and it meant so much to me. Yeah. And she says that's really the same, the same kind of logic is that that's what happens whenever we um, intentionally show the love of Christ to other individuals. Right. When we... Just go out of our way to be hospitable and kind. And uh, so that's the harbor of hospi uh, hospitality. Um, so here's, here's a verse from Acts 27.3, and I'm looking on the second page in the chapter here under the harbor of hosp hospitality. Um, we read, by the way, we read all of Acts 27 that first week, and sometimes we'll go back and read chunks of it, but as we're going through... Um, this is just one verse that she's really focusing on tonight. Chapter 27, verse 3. It says, The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. Amen. Um, so get this picture. Paul is a, he's a prisoner, and he is on his way to Rome, and uh, over the last um, 37 months, I've learned things about what prison life is like. And uh, if, if what they describe from that first century is any true indicator, uh, Paul would have been famished. He no doubt has lost weight because he's yeah. not getting nourishing food. Exactly. He's lacking vitamin. What is it? Vitamin K. The sun isn't getting any sunshine. Vitamin D. Yeah. And no sunshine. If, if in fact, he was in one of the dungeon type cells. By the way, that's how it's depicted in the movie that was just released. Paul, Apostle of Christ. It was a very touching movie. Um, there's a lot of different speculation about how accurate that is. Like, for instance, when Paul got to Rome, he was said to be under house arrest. And many Bible scholars believe that this meant he had freedoms that many prisoners didn't have. He was required to be in the same home at night, but maybe he could come and go. 
or at the very least, he could have people come and visit him and yeah. check on him. But maybe there's others who speculate, no, that's not really what house arrest means. But that would have been in Rome. But that doesn't have, that's not what he's experienced so far. So far as a prisoner before getting there, he's, he's experienced tremendous turmoil. And no doubt when it talks about him uh, three different times receiving 40 lashes, save one. Yeah. That means, so the, the Roman law was they were allowed to hit someone 40 times, but just so that they didn't break the law, they would only hit them 39 times. So that's what that phrase, that, that King James phrase, 40 save one, means 39 lashes. The only thing was they had figured out a way to sort of find a loophole. If we only hit them 39 times, but... If we have a cat of nine tails, that's a whip with nine different whips on it, then we could actually hit him 39 times nine, whatever the math is on that. And then they would also do horrible things like tie pieces of bone and yes. jagged rocks yeah. and, yeah. and uh, uh, just shards of pottery into the cat of nine tails. And, and, and so Paul endured that three different times. I mean, can you imagine how, uh, what that would be like? And so, so here he, in Acts 27, 3, he is granted by Julius, it's all right, Luke, Aristarchus, you guys take him. I don't know what he said. A couple of you guards go too. I don't know how it happened, but he said, you can go see your friends and get some supplies. Can you imagine how wonderful that was? I tell you, my son, after um, 14 months of eating, um, they call it slop. It was um, it, it was like gelled, like gelatin uh, tofu that was already cold and just um, it, it was. It turned, slop was a good name for it. And and wow. after after being in darkness literally for 14 months not knowing where north, south, east, or west was. Well, when he finally got that, that first meal, and then he was, he was given a radio, and he would put the headphones on, and he listened to Caleb, and it was the first time he heard music in 14 months. And the song that was playing, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but um, the lady who sings it, but, Thy will be done, Thy will be done. Oh, yes. And he wept and wept as he was eating his meal and listening to this wonderful, glorious music. So I, I have just this picture for Paul, and, and Paul hadn't done anything wrong. I mean, all Paul, well, not as a Christian. He had done things wrong before right. yeah. <laughs> being a Christian. But here he is, he's, he's no doubt he's, he's uh, emaciated, he's lost weight, he's, he's malnourished, and he gets this blessing to go and see his friends. Now, the scripture tells of different things that happen um, in harbors. Like one, she points out Acts 27 here where it says that he got to go and meet his friends and, and get some, some supplies. Um, and, and we don't know what he was given, but we can imagine that when it says Paul uh, in kindness of Paul, he allowed him to go to his friends so that they might provide for his needs. Maybe they packed up some food items. I'm sure they did. Maybe they said, Paul, boy, you don't look like you've changed clothes in a long time. Here's a, you know, a new set of clothes. I don't know what it was like. Maybe they said, we know how much you love to ride, and here's some scrolls. Here's some of your favorite um, scrolls to read. Here's some papyrus to write on. I, I don't know. But whatever it was, it blessed him. And do you remember there was this other story that happens in the book of Acts, and it's previous to this, but it's when he he's at um, the beach in Milan, and he calls for the elders of the Ephesians, the elders of the church in Ephesus, and they come and meet him at the beach, and he tells them um, that... You're not going to see me anymore. In obedience to God, I'm following this direction. 
and it says they embraced and they wept there on the beach and they wept hardest because they wouldn't see his face anymore and can you just imagine some of the amazing things that happen at the stops along, along the way? Um, I'm, I'm looking uh, on, on this page, uh, on the sidebar, it says, it says, at times, God provides compassionate hospitality for us, and at times, he asks us to provide hospitality for others. That's right. Um, and I'm drawn to this one statement. If, you, if, you, if you're looking on that page and you see off to the left here these words, um, I don't know how long the ship remained in Sidon, but I'm certain Paul and his friends shared lots of laughter, tears, and prayers. Amen. And I, I'm sure of that too. It must have been really, really meaningful, special. But then down at the next paragraph, she says, this harbor, this harbor stop was an unexpected uh, gift for Paul, Luke, and Aristarchus. So sometimes the greatest blessings in our lives are those unexpected gifts that come along. Um, I really believe this about God, and I, I think this is part of what... Uh, the, the reason that I have confidence to pray the way that we did earlier when we were talking about dreams and goals and new businesses. Um, by the way, that's something that I, I think I first heard it when John just mentioned that in a prayer meeting a couple of years ago. And it, was, it was just such, out of just a heart of purity, just the vision that we have for reaching our city. We need this. We need these things to happen. And, um, and, and I latched hold of that then, and I just thought, that's right. That's what we need to pray for God's blessings on, upon our industry and upon our creativity and, and for God to bless everything we do. But for me, and I don't know if your, your journey is identical to mine, but for me, the, there have been times where I've just been laying it all out on the field, so to speak. I mean, just really, really pouring 100% of my energy into serving the Lord and trying my best, you know, doing things that no one else would know about and just behind the scenes and just in private, just serving God. And there's been a few times when I've, I've felt so exhausted and so just drained. And all of a sudden, just like a boat out of the blue, totally <laughs> unexpected, just a blessing from the Lord happens. Amen. And, uh, and it might be a financial thing, but maybe not. Maybe it's just the kindest words that you've ever heard. Or maybe it's the thoughtfulness of a brother or sister in Christ who takes time to just say, that really blessed me. Or Amen. It, could, it could be any number of things, but our God, He loves to give surprises. That's right. And Blesses. So, um, now we're, we're going to do a little exercise here. I'm going to write these on the board, but um, I I want you to think with me of some ways that we as a church can really um, well. Let me let me condition it this way. I I already believe I believe that we already are hospitable and kind and. Friendly, I really do. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that in a braggadocious way at all, because there's always, always room for improvement. But I mean, as the pastor, I think I'm fortunate. I'm one of the fortunate ones because I hear these kinds of comments all the time from people that will say, "Your church is just so friendly. They're so genuinely authentic hey, and they're so compassionate." And, and now, what I don't know. I mean, there may be people that say other things, but they don't tell the pastor. I mean, why would they? You know? So I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm getting a very biased opinion. But I do think we're doing a good job of practicing hospitality. But I want to just dream with you for a few minutes. Can you think of things, and I'm not talking about super spiritual, maybe just little everyday ways, or let's just dream a little bit. How can we be better 
at hospitality. Um, can you think of any practical steps? Maybe something that we are not doing at all that you, that you think, oh, I'd love to see us be able to do this or that or just, uh, you know, that there's no right or wrong. But I'm just trying to uh, open it up for some discussion. Anybody got any ideas? Nancy? Sending a card to someone that you haven't seen at church for a while and just telling them that you Yes, that is a great, a great way. And that doesn't have to, like, only be the pastor. In fact, I think it's more meaningful when it is That's from right. someone. Nancy, I know that you do that. I mean, I, I happen to know that about you. That she's so good about uh, if someone misses. I, I've always pictured it happening this way, but it's never quite gotten this organized. But... Um, we have a lead team at our church, and that, that team com is comprised of church board members, church pastoral staff, and directors, if you will, of all the different departments. And then their, all of those people, you take them and their families, and then I would, there's a few other people that maybe they're not part of that team, but they are really... Um, very, very involved. And, and my approach is that I see in the scriptures that Jesus had his inner three, and then after that he had his twelve, and then he sent them out in groups of two by seventy, or some say by seventy-two. There are studies that show that the effectiveness of a pastor is that a pastor can really pastor about 72 people by himself and do, do it effectively. The ones who pastor huge mega churches have a team of people that replicates this many, many times. Yeah. So, um, so I, I love every person in the church, want so much everybody that attends our church to know, man, we love you, we welcome you. Um, but I'm going to tell you, sometimes when the pastor tries to do it all, you feel spread as thin as Skippy peanut butter. Yeah, and, and you just can't do it all. As much as you want to, as much as you try. So so I, that group, I really focus on them. And then I'm praying for different people to replicate this. Um, I, I kind of see our church like a big vineyard with different sections and and maybe maybe you happen to be planted right here. That's where God's got you growing in the vineyard. Amen. And and you know you don't notice that this little grape over here is falling off the vine, but you certainly know about the grapes in your area. Mm -hmm. And if one of those grapes misses church, then write a write a card or send a text or an email or a phone call. Um, let them know. I just noticed. I love you. I miss you. Are you okay? Is there anything I can pray with you about? Excellent. What else? Hey, we're, we're just dreaming. That's a wonderful idea. What else do we put up here? Yeah. I want to share with something that's actually, we're doing good. Yeah. It, it's when new people come. I see that um, they're welcome. Uh, when Grace and I were first coming to church, we were, you know, looking for a lot of churches in the area. Um, it was that spirit, that welcomeness that we found here that brought us in and kept us here. And when I see new people over the weeks, they come in. Um, actually, I'm, I'm kind of a shy guy in a lot of ways. I had to force myself to talk to people. Um, I would have to force myself to say something to somebody because I'm the kind of guy I'd rather be alone and just, I mean, I, you could be in a room with four walls and I'd be happy counting tiles or whatever. <laughs> you know, but but um, I had to force myself to get out of that comfort zone. Um, but I see people there and they're being welcomed, you know. Uh, if someone sits by me, I'm gonna grab them and show, tell them, you know, invite them to yeah. see pastor. But that's something I see that's really good here, is that hospitality, the greeting of people. One thing that I've noticed that you do, Oliver, and I appreciate it so much is, um, when we do the meet and greet time on Sunday mornings, there's been, I think, two, maybe three times where he's been to say, hey, Pastor, did you know these people are brand new? Oh, I didn't meet them. Thank you. 
And that means a lot. I appreciate that very much. Um, I think I think we do good at this. And the one thing that I I put up here that I'm praying, Lord, how do we close the back door? And that's that's pastor talk, and it's the age-old discussion. People coming in new through the front door, but when folks slip away out of the back door and you and, and you think, wait, where did they go? I haven't seen them for a few weeks. Oh, by the time you realize it, you try to contact them and, and follow up. So there, there's something that we can do better on that, and we're trying to get better at it. By the way, Sunday morning, we had four new families on one day. We, we will go sometimes, we'll go Sundays where there's nobody new at all. But this last Sunday, we had four new families. But what I was going to observe, not one of them filled out a Connect card. Not one of them did the text. Uh, they were window shopping. They're just, they, I don't want I don't want to commit, and I don't blame them. This is an important decision. I want to come in, just meet people, see how, see if it feels right. I'm praying about it. So um, uh, sometimes it's, um, and I, I'm hoping that some of those stick. In fact, one of them, I'm convinced, will come in a wonderful conversation afterward. Um, anything else you can put up here? Yeah, Shelley. I would like to see more of a ministry for the shut-ins, people who can't come to church mm -hmm. because they're too ill, or they're caring for a family member that's ill, so they, they are restricted. I'd like to see more of that, because there's a real need out in the community. There is. Um, um, they aren't connected to anything. Do you got any ideas on how we could fulfill that? Not this okay. <laughs> okay. Well, doing, right. doing the Facebook Live now kind of will help with that. Well, well you know, that is, that's wonderful. That's a nice observation. observation. Yeah. One, one of the ladies that um, works at the home up here, she was all excited because she got to see you Sunday on Facebook. Oh, good. Uh, great, excited. great. Yay, I got to go to church today. <laughs> hey, along those lines, I'm going to say this this Sunday, but when when we are in the service, I'm actually going to say, we're on Facebook Live, and um, I'm encouraging all of you in the room to go on, if you have a device, to do it, and share it. Share it right now. When you share it, there's people in your circle that are not in his circle, that are not in her circle, That's but right. they will... You know, they'll connect, and so um, it's, it is amazing technology, really, true. Uh, Jim, did you have an observation? Uh, I'm just visiting, but uh, um, my wife is involved with WM's Island Church, uh -huh. and speaking about shut-ins, just recently, WM's, they meet every Tuesday, okay. and they make it maybe, I don't know, once every three months or so, they um, get together and they go to the shut-ins. And they might take them a meal or just fellowship with them and pray with them. That's how they do That's it. a fantastic idea. And then um, one of the things that we started doing in my church, my daughter likes to cook, likes to bake. She's a very good baker, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, like you talked about um, new people, visitors, things like that. Or, you know, when people come to the church and you just kind of recognized and today it was like, man, it's not good enough. So this okay. year we started where um, my daughter, every first Sunday, we tried every first Sunday, my daughter makes like six cakes and like 24 cupcakes. And what we do is we recognize people in the church for their anniversaries, we give them cake, and people for their oh. birthdays, we give them a cupcake. Sure. And then we take the rest of it and we just sell it. Sure. Sure. <laughs> so we we'll have a cupcake for a dollar <laughs> and the cakes for three dollars just to keep the ministry going. Oh, yeah. And then we kind of added to that lately now that we have visitor pastors or uh, evangelists that come. We make, she makes a cake and we just present it to them. Wonderful. And um, the other thing we do is like when we have visitors, we, it's that particular Sunday. Yeah, just give them cupcakes and cakes. Thanks, Jim, for sharing. Um, those are great ideas. I do think 
it's incredibly important for each church to find their own identity. And like I was just thinking, some of the conversations I've had with the ladies that I think would do fantastic. I told Sharon, feel free to reach over and throw him on the ear right now because this guy's full of suggestions. He will, he will eat anything, right? <laughs> but, um, if it's got a cake, if it's a cake, I mean, come on. She makes oh, that's, great cake, so that is, that's yeah. wonderful. That's wonderful, and she does. She does. And, she does. and for my birthday. <laughs> It, I'm going to kind of wrap it down. I've, I've let it go to we're, we're kind of out of time, but I, I'm going to make a, a closing comment. But does anybody else have any? Jim, thank you very much for sharing that. That's wonderful. Yeah. Any other suggestions? Sorry. Who was it? Oh, yeah, okay. Out of all of that, what you said last week is really stuck in my head. You used to love the LUV. Uh -huh. Listen, understand, and validate for new people because sometimes they're just looking for somebody just to talk to because they have issues and validate that you've heard them. Say that you pray for them and then the next week after find them and say, hey, how's that doing? Um, Holly, Holly called me and I, I tried calling her back but nobody would pick up and I, there was no voicemail so I tried calling twice. But she called and That's asked awesome. last week, hey, hey, how, how are your feet doing? Are they doing better? You know, we're going to continue to pray for you. Hannah was fantastic. available for me Saturday. She listened. She helped me. And so, I, I mean, I feel that a lot of people need to listen to what's going on in a person's right. life. Not yes. just say, okay, well, I'll pray for you. Validate it and say, hey, how's that coming along? I, I spoke with you last week. How's that coming along? Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, it seems like Grace, did you also? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that we had attended PFA, uh -huh. and uh, one of the things that I learned uh, going there, um, church is so huge. You know, it's hard okay. to get to know people. But on a Wednesday night, they would have cell groups, mm, that's, and yeah. um, that's when I got to know a lot of people, and I felt connected because that church is too huge. <laughs> you <laughs> just like a number. But um, there I met a whole bunch of people that were, you know, really loving the Lord and wanted to serve Him, and we got to know each other. And that's what people like. They want to belong, and they want to become friends, and, you know. So I, I really, you know, like that. Thanks for sharing it. That's been a, a dream of mine and, and other leaders, too. I had a goal to try to begin that this year, but I would be honest with you, maybe in the near future. But, um, I do. I also value that. I think that's really, really uh, important. Now, was there one other? Was someone was? Okay. Oh, right. Here. Yeah, and it just kind of goes along with that. But I would like to see the youth involved because I think sometimes that connection with the younger, like you said, with new families, that was the biggest thing I know coming in with us was that Stephen connected with someone. So mm -hmm. you know, sometimes that is that that key. That was that. Yeah, I want to, you know, mom, we want to go back to that church because they were, that was that connection. So yeah. even if there's like a representative or someone where you have a new family and you can say, hey, you know, talk to this, this person or talk to this person mm -hmm. in that age group. Because, you so know. So here you're kind of saying the, the networking of what we have. Yes. Just getting the word out. By the way, Shelly, hats off to you and a praise comment to you. One of the families that was here Sunday just commented how much our children enjoy children's yeah. church. Yeah. And so, yeah. thank you for your <laughs> Well, you know, Pastor, that's how we even started this church. Because when yeah. I first get, came here, first I didn't know this church was here. We found it driving around, the girls and I. But I went to one church and not one person greeted us. Not even the greeter yeah. uh, greeted us. Nobody came up and said anything to us. Uh, then I tried another one, and we had gone maybe two or three times, but the youth group, not one person would even talk to Carissa. She'd walk in by herself, and she walked out by herself. So then we found this place, and that was the first thing I was thinking about. I want something for the girls. Yeah. That's important to me that the girls get established in a church. So we're standing outside, and Miss Lynetta came up to us. And I told her, and I tell you what, before I knew it, everybody was around Carissa just welcoming her. 
And then, of course, mm -hmm. Shelly just took Brianna under her wing. And that was it. And I knew this is, because that was yeah. important. And because <laughs> of where, you know, we're not perfect. Yeah. And we fall short in so many areas. But we're doing good on, on many things. And we're trying to improve all the time. So thanks for that feedback. And how, how sad, because I mean, I, I'm sure if that church knew that was the perception. I, it would be crushing. Well, you know, the sad thing is, yeah. is, I went in with my brother-in-law and his wife, <laughs> and still nobody greeted us. Okay. You know, okay. And talk about feeling really uncomfortable. It was like, yeah, I'm not going back. You know? So we've got to close out here, but Jesus said, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. That's right. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. <laughs> I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And um, a year ago, we did this teaching series um, called God's Favorite Fishing Holes. It was based upon this, this very text and praying that God would enable us to launch new ministries. I just wanted to give you some feedback on something that Barbara told me. In fact, maybe, I don't, well, I wouldn't put you on the spot, but Barbara told me... Um, I think it was two Wednesdays ago. No, it was when we were here working that day about hospice ministry that she's involved in. And, um, and I'm, I'm proud of Barbara for her involvement with people right at the crisis point of facing death. And, and sometimes families don't know what to do. They're so frightened. And sadly, sometimes people are all alone. I mean, even facing death. And um, Barbara has had some neat encounters with that. If that's something that God puts on your heart that you think, I'd like to be part of that, go and talk with her and uh, learn how. Because there's training involved. There's a lot of training that you have to do to be able to get to that point. But what a, what a great blessing. Um, there was this awesome story in the book. If you didn't read it, you should read it about when Kay Burnett went to Romania and her and her daughter were invited to the apartment of a single lady. And uh, she was so excited to have them as her guests. And they went into this apartment building that looked like it would be falling down. She got into this rickety, old-timey elevator. She said, I prayed, God, give me faith to make it to the third floor. And she got out and went in this apartment of 600 square foot, small little table, uh, an old, uh, just ratty couch and a small little end table and, and but they walked in smelled the aroma of uh, bread it seemed like some kind of bread she made aroma, with some tea and, and yeah. she was so oh it was coffee cake yeah. coffee cake yeah. and, as, and she was so thrilled to have them as her guests yeah. and Kay Burnett made the statement that hospitality has nothing to do with um, having the means or the goods right. or the money yeah, that's or right. hospitality is a matter of the heart. Yes, it and is. So um, I, I just want us yeah. to pray that God will uh, use us all uh, yes. as hospitable Me, people. Father, Me, we thank you for yes. your teaching for us tonight. And we, we embrace yes. it. Um, Lord, when I just think about some of the hospitable people in our church, they're so gracious and kind and um, I think of people that have made meals and who have invited and opened up their homes. I think of the ones who have, have honored uh, newborn babies or birthdays or um, special occasions. Like Jill was talking about with, with cakes or cupcakes or all kinds of ways. Thank you for the ones who are writing cards like what Nancy mentioned. Um, help us each in our own way to reach out and be hospitable. Um, thank you for the times when we get to be in the harbor. Yes. We know that ships were made for the open waters, but we praise you for the chances when we get to just rest and relax. We thank you for the chance when people are hospitable to us. Yes. We thank you for the chances that we have to practice hospitality to those around us. And let it be more and more the case. Uh, guide your church, make us strong, we pray, in the holy name of Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, amen and amen. All right, God bless you. Hey, if you need to see closer up what Nancy is buying there, um, she, she, oh, it's in the kitchen? Okay, God bless all of you. See you.